Thank you, Anita. I feel very fortunate to be here today with such a, a talented group of individuals talking about some very exciting topics. Over the last couple of days, we've learned a little bit more about the latest advancements in, in cultured meat. And then today we've touched on some topics related to space. And so for, for this session, I want to open it up and, and really discuss what it really means to produce future foods and more specifically getting into cultured meat or cultivated meat in space. Now, uh, before I do that, there's two things I want to touch real quick, uh, very quickly. Uh, the first is being the, the title of this session. So the future of meat in a multi-planetary world. So I got some feedback from some of the attendees that world is never multi-planetary. World is our earth. And I thought about that quite a bit. And it actually reminded me of the, um, the, the uh, talk from Brian Spears yesterday, who kind of uh, uh, did a deep dive into the definition of meat and how the, the definition of meat has changed over the years. And I, I looked up the definition of world. And although Earth is in many of the definitions, such as the Earth together with all of its countries, peoples, and natural features, uh, or uh, denoting the most uh, important uh, of, of things on the planet of, of Earth, right? Earth is in those uh, uh, items. But if you look into a little bit uh, deeper into like the, the essence and the etymology of the, wor uh, of the word world, then it actually comes to age of man. So age of man is where it originally comes from. And so if you think of the age of man going into different planets, then I would say the world is this multi-planetary uh, thing now where you can include everything in the universe. And so I'm really excited to look into what that means. And to start off, uh, uh, before we even go into introductions of everyone on the panel, I want one word answers. Uh, and we'll get back, we'll go into a little bit of a deeper dive into this question first. But first, one word answers. Is space making a comeback? And we'll go down alphabetically on this list. So Didier, do you want to go ahead and start? Oh, I think you. Exponentially. OK, great. And um, Zina, you're next on my list. No. No, OK. Graham. Perhaps. <laughs> Perhaps, okay, I love it. Okay, so, so this gives a, a lot of fuel for our conversation. So uh, now let's jump right in. Uh, I'd like to ask each of you to uh, please introduce yourself, your organization and what projects you are currently working on in the realm of space to set the stage. Uh, and for this one, isn't it, if you can um, please go first. Thank you for the opportunity, Alex. It's great to be here. It's fantastic to see the interest in solving one of the city sector's uh, key challenges. And I hope that the culture and community feels a surge of pride um, to be involved in such a historic moment between, uh, for both um, astronomy and gastronomy. So I am a seasoned NASA engineer where I run a spacecraft division. I've spent the last 16 years building um, large spacecraft and six large spacecraft and dozens of autonomous uh, small satellites. And um, I also see, because of that experience, how food innovations to feed the hungry on Earth could um, serve as inspiration for nutrition um, solutions on the moon or other locations humans might eventually choose to inhabit. So I founded a terraformer a few years ago with the goal to make food ubiquitous um, everywhere humans want to inhabit. And right now it operates on this planet <laughs> in this world as a a B2C um, marketplace where edible um, food gardeners can grow uh, edible uh, uh, gardens for people who want a garden grown in their home. And usually we have um, challenging soils and challenging uh, locales so that we learn um, a lot about what kind of um, seeds. Sometimes we use halophytes um, instead of um, glycophytes and what can grow um, on a difficult terrain, which informs uh, what we may need to do in space. Excellent. Graham, uh, or actually DDA Graham, whoever would like to jump in first. 
Uh, just want to say thank you, Alex, for, for inviting me to be here. I'm really excited to talk today. I'm Graham Green. I'm the Chief Product Officer at Mission Space Food. Um, I spent my, my personal career, I spent the bulk of my, my professional life working in Michelin star restaurants in New York and California. And I spent a little bit of time abroad as well um, in Copenhagen and in, and in England. Uh, but at Mission Space Food, we're the first commercial company looking at food and nutrition in space. Um, our, our goal was kind of to reimagine what food could look like uh, in, in space food programs. And in asking that question, we've, we've explored many different factors from multi-sensory um, perception, cognitive health, nutrition, psychological components of um, preparing and eating food in isolation. And what we've realized is that there's a significant commercial um, application to many of these products. So there's ubiquitous products that we, we know of um, in terrestrial markets, whether that's modern baby formula or um, even energy bars that kind of found their birthplace in the innovation that was required for space. Uh, so what we're, we're really looking to do is to build on a history of innovations that have happened for space flight uh, that have drastically changed the way that people um, consume food on earth. And because we really believe at our core that the constraints that exist in space in terms of specifically in terms of food, um, as, as far as, you know, shelf stable, lightweight, nutrient dense foods can really have significant impacts um, on the way that people eat food on earth. So in terms of the projects that we're working on right now, um, one of our first projects is to sort of reimagine the way that a multivitamin can work. So there's a significant issue with um, micronutrient uh, deficiency among the US population and, and globally as well. Normally that kind of thing I think is associated with malnutrition in like in third world countries, but there's also a problem with uh, people in the United States and the modern diets eating things that are um, sort of calorie rich, but nutrient poor. And I think a, a big component of that is the fact that people have a hard time building, uh, building habits around practices that are pleasurable. And so what we wanted to do is cr create a confectionery product that's as delicious or more delicious than, you know, any, any chocolate that you can find on the shelf, but then also offers uh, a tailored micronutrient content uh, to whatever your individual needs are. Excellent, thank you. Uh, DDA? Mm -hmm. Yeah, very happy to be here and uh, congratulations, Alex and Anita and all the team for this uh, great event. We're really having a lot of fun and uh, kudos. And Aleph Farms is a, a cultivated meat company, which has been co-founded with uh, the Strauss Group, a food company in Israel and the Technion, Israel Institute of Technology, as a technology transfer from Professor Levenberg's lab. And uh, what is uh, uh, characterizing Aleph Farms in this uh, emerging industry is probably uh, first the focus on uh, uh, cultivating uh, structured steaks and in incorporating tissue engineering approaches and, and scaffolding and uh, uh, te uh, technologies, but also uh, working with different uh, cell types. Um, and we have a very strong focus on uh, sustainability and, and that's uh, really connected to our um, space program. And the way we um, actually uh, entered this, um, this uh, space uh, environment was uh, through this um, a successful experiment we performed and um, managed by um, a 3D bioprinting solutions. Our partners in the, in the 3D bioprinting uh, um, technologies uh, last year in September at the ISS. And since then we've uh, really uh, worked the last 12 months on structuring a bit more and um, what you know, might be a program for our space activities, better understanding what the needs are and what's uh, possible to do. And we've uh, today announced um, our Aleph Zero program, which is a uh, very really much a focus on uh, a growing meat in uh, um, um, multi-planetary colonies, primarily on Mars, but also on, uh, on Moon. Uh, we've worked on that project with uh, um, our special consultant for space, Pascal Rosenfeld, and our uh, head of sustainability, Lee, and our um, VP R&D, uh, Neta. And Aleph Zero means, uh, has, has two meanings. First one is uh, um, it's uh, the, the symbol of the smallest infinite number in math. And actually, the idea is to uh, bring infinity closer by um, allowing uh, deep space exploration and colonies and outer worlds. Uh, but it's also um, a kind of, um, um, it, it evokes the, um, the, the constraints we have in space, uh, a growing meat with uh, near, near zero resources. 
And we do see it as a kind of a Formula One team, same as a, a car companies, car manufacturers might have Formula One activity to kind of test new materials or technologies in the most extreme and harshest environments. Um, we were testing here the, um, the frontiers of uh, sustainability of uh, closed loop production systems of uh, uh, efficiency of uh, um, uh, reducing the, uh, the uh, real estate of our equipment. Um, and that can be applied to um, implementing a vision on earth for producing high quality nutrition for anyone, anytime, anywhere. And just to conclude uh, on that, as, uh, as mentioned, we believe that today we're facing one of the most uh, significant food crises in the last 50 years. And the United Nations uh, just uh, um, published yesterday as part of the World Food Program Award that uh, they estimate uh, that uh, 270 million people um, globally are suffering from hungry this year, which is uh, more than twice last year's amount. And that's uh, just getting worse because of COVID-19. So I believe that uh, pushing the frontiers of sustainability of a uh, zero resource or near zero resource and high quality nutrition can really help providing better access to food uh, in the most remote places in the world and, and make it accessible to everyone. Great, thank you. And congratulations on the Aleph Zero launch. For those of you that might not have seen either the announcement or the video, we've added a link to uh, the video in the general channel. So be sure to check that out. Um, excellent. So we all kind of gave our one word answers to is space making a comeback? And um, is it, as an A, you said no. So maybe you can start by telling us a little bit about um, where, where your answer stems from. And um, the background of the question is really has space kind of uh, increased in popularity or even media attention? So um, so please enlighten us a little bit in, in addition to from your answer. Happy to. It's, uh, it's, you know, it's a polarizing question to ask someone who's been deeply uh, embedded in, in the space bubble, I will say, uh, for the last 16 years. Space is complex, space is hard, and um, the work has to be achieved step by step. It's not something that happens overnight. It doesn't happen in a garage. Uh, it doesn't happen in a dorm room over two years that you took SpaceX um, over 15 years to accomplish the outstanding uh, achievement last May of launching two humans into space on behalf of um, NASA and the US. And so it just, it, it takes a while and I, I don't want that to be lost. And while the media tends to remind the public of our work when we achieve historic milestones. I just wanted to underscore the point that it, it just takes a lot of hard work of lots of thousands of people who have their head down and who don't live for that media announcement. So there's a lot of work that's going on now. You know, we won't get to asteroids and, um, you know, lunar settlements, but, you know, that's been going on for a while, but most people will hear about them in the mainstream when it actually, um, when we actually have people living on the moon, but that's been going on um, much longer than I've been in space. So that, that was the rationale for, for going with a strong no. Great, and, and to kind of go through the, the scale, Graham, you said perhaps, can you give us some detail based off of your answer? Yeah, and I, I think Azina did as, as good of a job as I could hope to of answering that question. But I think um, when we say that it's making a comeback, I think that implies that it's fallen off. And I think while public perception is is definitely growing, that doesn't necessarily um, correlate to how much work has been done in the past to create these successes that are being publicized now. And so I think uh, for sure commercialization and, and the, upcoming, um, the upcoming mission plans have led to an increased popularity in space, maybe in the last couple of years and even you know there's like new Netflix movies that maybe make it seem as if there's more going on in space but I think um, much of the background work that happens day to day maybe just isn't quite cool enough to make the news and so people might think that, that there's nothing going on but yeah I think like Azine said that everything that makes the news is a culmination of many many years of hard work so I think uh, space, space isn't really making a comeback because it never went away. I like that. And I, I'm definitely a victim of those Netflix documentaries and, and uh, uh, shows that, that are on Netflix. Um, great. So 
Didier, I love the example you used of the Formula One team. And so um, your answer was exponentially, right? So is space making a comeback exponentially? Can you give us some detail on your thought? Yes, of course. And uh, I appreciate that uh, the timelines in space are much longer than on Earth and that everything is, is really the every achievement and milestone is the result of a very, um, you know, long term effort. Um, on the other hand, I do believe that there are three reasons why uh, space is coming back. The first one is that uh, we do see more and more um, exponential um, technologies converging in, in many different uh, fields in uh, technology. And I think that also applies to space, meaning it's not just uh, um, space per se. We, we see within space, the conversions of uh, 3D printing of uh, advancement in um, energy storage in, uh, um, in uh, uh, AI, uh, which are, uh, together um, are actually um, quickly evolving. And uh, the convergence of those technologies are, are multiplying the, the, the impact on uh, uh, the speed of what is possible to achieve. Uh, so that's one reason. The second reason, I, I believe that we, what's new in the last few years, which, which was not the case with the Apollo mission, for instance, in the, in the 60s, is that the, the large agencies are really giving the prime time to private companies as well. That there, there had always been private companies involved in, in space missions as subcontractors or, uh, or projectors, but we see today companies like uh, SpaceX, like uh, Blue Origin by Amazon and, and a, a bunch of other companies which are really um, investing private money in developing space. Uh, and we know private companies can be more efficient uh, quicker than uh, space agencies. Uh, so that's a new development which I believe will make uh, um, space exploration quicker and faster. And the third one is also um, that space has been democratized. You know, if uh, 30, 40 years ago, it was just, uh, you know, NASA and, and, and Roscosmos in Russia, for instance. Today, it's not just the large countries, but even in Israel, for instance, we had the, the Space IL program with a very limited uh, um, budgets we were able to to get to the moon and to leave a footprint on the moon <laughs> eventually we, have, we haven't really landed very smoothly there but i think it, it really shows that with very little resources now you can achieve milestones uh, in israel we have many space programs in schools and uh, uh, high school students taking part in uh, experiments in, in space which was something just unthinkable 10 years ago so there's a democratization and, and uh, um, um, space become much more popular, not only just uh, you know, the, the activity of uh, a, a couple of a uh, handful uh, um, of uh, um, very large and well-funded space agencies. So th th those are the reasons why I believe space is, um, is coming back strongly. Okay, great. And I think um, to, to kind of facilitate the rest of the conversation, I'd like us to define a really a threshold in terms of what we are designing for. And so when we are thinking about food in space, are we thinking about, for example, uh, what we see in, in the DDA's background, which is uh, perhaps colonization on, on, on Mars? Are we designing for that or are we designing for the research and everything that's taking place on the ISS? What is the threshold? Should we be thinking very broadly? Is there a big range? Any insight on kind of what we should be designing for? And, and maybe um, maybe uh, Graham and uh, Ezene, you guys can start with this question. Yeah, for sure. So I think, I, I think the threshold changes depending on what's being attempted to be accomplished, I guess for, um, for scope, maybe like in the shorter in the shorter duration missions, and, and Grace Douglas touched on this in in the talk that she just gave. But in the shorter duration missions, say even something as as long as thirty days, um, a food a food system that has meal replacement bars and these types of things that have negative psychological effects in the long term um, isn't so much a big deal. It might not affect health and it might not affect performance so much. But if you look at you know potentially an eighteen month mission or, or a much longer mission. I think the scope changes. And so I think at, at the beginning, we were looking sort of at making sure that there was enough caloric intake and, and that the nutrient levels were at the right rate, um, but that the psychological effects of eating food that reminds you of home and, and kind of combats the, the effects of isolation 
was maybe a, a lower priority. But as, as the as the missions get longer and as you get farther away from home and the effects of isolation increase, I think that the priority of you know team morale and um, general psychological benefits of eating food that you enjoy kind of takes a higher uh, a higher position. So I would um, I'd like to expand on that a bit. And um, I, I think that the short, medium, and long um, duration timelines of missions are certainly something one needs to think about. The food being such a critical thing that one, um, we know this is not an assumption. If you're going to consume food, you are alive and you are, this is food for a human. So I would focus on designing for the challenge we've always had, which is to create gravity defining but delicious food. Hopefully not, you know, dry frozen or dehydrated or thermal uh, treated. I'd focus on, and so under that challenge of creating this uh, delicious food, safety. Um, is it safe? You know, because food poisoning is, is not something we have, um, we have the opportunity to correct because it could lead to serious uh, damages. Taste and smell, that flexibility because it differs per human. Some people can taste salt and sugar. Others claim they can't taste anything. Um, so playing with that and being flexible and exaggerating some taste. Um, and then the nutritional uh, component, which uh, Graham has just described. And secondly, processing. So, you know, when you, when you solve the problem of, okay, I've got something delicious that's safe and tastes and smells good and is nutritious, how is it being processed? How, how is uh, this cultured meat um, being cooked in space? Um, do they just uh, peel it apart and eat it? Uh, can it be added to another dish? And what's the assembly um, process? Is it already assembled or does someone have to pre-assemble it and you know, heat up? So I think that those are some of the um, defining thresholds um, that, will, that will help to create something that will be um, beneficial for any of these uh, mission durations. Great, and, and um, as we, to, to tailor that question to DDA, uh, with the work that your team is doing, would you say it's focused on the short, medium, or kind of long-term missions now that we have kind of defined this scale? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I believe there are two very different setups for, um, for food in space. The first one is uh, the, the space crafts um, or the, you know, the um, uh, deep space explorations in terms of a, a long uh, travel time or, or stays at the, the ISS. Where the, in, in this uh, setup, the, um, the, the room is very limited and the, you know, the real estate and the payload of the, um, of the equipment is, is a critical. And um, the crew, crew time for preparing the food is also very important. There, there are a lot of uh, restrictions. Um, of course, the, the preservation of the food, etc. If we look at uh, um, uh, human colonies on uh, uh, different planets, that's a different setup, meaning that it's actually a permanent um, a colony of uh, people living there. The, um, the, let's say the, um, the surface is uh, uh, available, meaning we can uh, definitely build a larger facilities. Um, on the other hand, the the production process should be as closed loop as possible, meaning there is a, a it's very, on, on moon you can ship food on Mars it's very difficult. So you cannot really uh, get access to uh, outer supply, uh, supplies from out of the, out of the, uh, the, the world you live in. And so the, um, the constraints are very different. And uh, actually we decided to focus on, uh, on colonies and, and actually to, to adapt and uh, the biofarm concept we have for providing food anytime, anywhere um, to, um, you know, any people wherever it lives, whether it's in, uh, you know, Antarctica or in, uh, on the moon on Mars, for us, it's a, it's a very similar um, uh, setup, which is actually near zero resources, a very hostile environment and um, a necessity for producing and, and delivering high nutrition. Um, at, at the time it is uh, required for, for human consumption. Great, and, and the kind of Arctic mission is, is, a, is a great example to kind of have that really tie back to bring what we're doing in space you know, back to planet Earth. Now, 
Uh, isn't it? You mentioned something very important when it comes to any type of meat product is is cooking. So I guess a, a question to everyone on the panel is: uh, is is there any kind of uh, cooking that's happening at least on, on the ISS right now, other than just adding hot water to anything? Is is there any cooking? So we know that there is. Um some cooking that goes on, uh, but there, I mean, there are requirements and uh, Grace may have gone over this, I don't want to be repetitive, but you can't heat something, you know, higher than 80 degrees um, Fahrenheit, for instance. So uh, it, it just introduces a number of limitations. And um, most of the food they eat is grown in a, a greenhouse out there at the International Space Station. And, it may not be the form, um, to DDA's point, that um, other astronauts or humans who, other explorers, if we will, you know, will live in. So their, their, um, their habitat may be different. Um, but, you know, we started, we've come a long way. We started with meat and our food in a, in a paste, right? It looks um, in a tube like a toothpaste. And now they have, um, some variety that sometimes needs to be warmed up, uh, some they eat cold, but there, there is some, some limitation. I think the challenge for cultured meat is, you know, what does cultured meat taste like with spirulina gnocchi, for instance, knowing that we can grow spirulina, we can grow wheat, you know, spinach, lettuce, uh, tomatoes, uh, potatoes, soy, rice, and onions um, in space. And so those are the nine that uh, we tend to, treat as the focal point for research. So how, how does the culture need align with those uh, complements, if you will? Great, and I think another thing that comes to mind is uh, the, the, I think it's called the veggie system for growing uh, plants. And so uh, we briefly saw a slide about that in one of the earlier presentations, but um, if there were to be any type of um, example, and maybe this is directed towards DDA, is there anything we could imagine of, would it be some sort of enclosed system or would it be more of a larger kind of uh, production, maybe similar to, to some, some of the mock-ups? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, we believe that for, for colonies, meaning for permanent uh, habitat um, on outer planets, we do need to have a, um, a production loop which is as circular as possible, meaning a circular production um, reuse of any materials and, and, and thinking out of the box in terms of the type of uh, inputs we can um, incorporate into the production process to have this uh, um, meat production as a, as closed loop as possible. Um, we do believe that uh, you know, there, there are basically three ways to think about the, the food in space, meaning there's the, the prepackaged food, which is actually the, the most common um, way to, to deliver food to, to the ISS or to, to a, a spacecraft today, which has some limitations in terms of, uh, you know, storage, in terms of uh, um, the, the nutritional value of the food is also going down with time and, and it's, it's boring, it's not fun. Um, and then the, there is um, there are two other uh, approaches, which are on one hand a kind of, a kind of an intermediate approach, which is uh, using 3D printing for um, making um, ready to to consume food. And for instance, the ISS I saw the, the experiment for um, for 3D printing a pizza, which has been uh, um, <laughs> consumed at the time, which is uh, kind of providing more, you know, uh, viability in terms of the type of food and and adapting it to to, to the um, you know to, to what the the astronaut would like to eat or, or providing more um, more options, and then there is uh, the bioregenerative uh, food approach, which is uh, what cultivated meat is about, meaning producing the food from A to Z on the site, and that's what we're, we're um, talking about today. Uh, and there are a lot of um, constraints for that. Uh, it's it's definitely not an easy task. Um, but there are a lot of, um, I mean, I, I don't think there is really an alternative for permanent habitat in, uh, in other planets. Uh, so that's what we, we need to solve in order to really um, allow um, the human species to be uh, multi-planetary. And I think that just to conclude on this point, 
you know, that's the, the essence of life to spread where it can. Um, that's what you see in nature. Uh, when there is a void in nature, uh, some type of life is actually um, uh, taking a, a you know position there and, and expanding into the into voids and and when we have the capabilities to expand into new worlds and and uh, um, being able to grow food in space and um, either fruit and vegetables and, and meat we know meat is uh, uh, necessary for a balanced nutrition and that will really um, be the the triggers for um, for humans to to spread to other worlds. That's really the, the main barrier as we uh, see today. And um, so we need both fruit and vegetables, and as Ine talked about that, but also um, also to, to crack the issue of uh, producing meat. Great. So I, I want to kind of shift the, the conversation a little bit more towards food acceptability. And uh, Dide, you did mention that, the, you know, the, the pizza, because I think that the uh, pizza is something that is appetizing and that people want it. We need to make sure that that uh, the astronauts or anybody that is in uh, in space is is eating. And so, um, how important is it to have familiar foods? And I think that if you do look at some of the MRE examples, you see things like um, chicken and pasta, foods that are familiar. I think scrambled eggs is is, is very popular. And so. Um, do we need to kind of stick to those familiar foods or can we kind of shift this perception and maybe um, create new foods that are very desirable in, in, uh, in space? Yeah, I, I, can, I can take that one. Uh, so, I, so I think when you talk about, when you talk about the simpler, similarities between what's considered a comfort food and the types of food that say the military uses for their MREs, I think I think the correlation between those two foods has less to do with the fact that pe some people consider them comfort foods and more to do with the fact that those foods are cheap, which I, which I think is why um, a lot of people consider those things to be comfort foods. But going back to your point about whether or not we might need to change those flavors as we push to become you know, an, an interplanetary species, um, the, the group of people that will potentially be going and living on a, in another habitat won't come from entirely the same background, right? And so their definition of what's a comfort food will be, won't, there, there won't be a unanimous answer, unanimous answer as to what a comfort food is. And so these types of um, cheap products like eggs and, and, and flour and, and all these different things that I think they'll certainly have to be adapted to the, to the taste preferences of, um, of the people going on these missions because you know, nostalgia is an important, an important component to like psychologically uh, to, to team morale and to, and to the psychological benefits of eating food. And so I think the future meal programs will have to take into account the cultural backgrounds of, um, of the different astronauts. Any other insight on that before we kind of move on? Oh, go ahead. I would, um, I would add to that a culture of work because um, I think that it, it has been, it has been noted that the astronauts that I wouldn't use the word complain, but who uh, comment on the food and um, its taste are usually uh, European astronauts. So when you think of an Italian astronaut who's used to delicious Italian food um, and, and they don't get that in space and they miss you know, the freshness of, uh, of the food. And it's not to say that we don't have fresh food here, but the military style, um, food that's given to our astronauts, I think it came from a, a work culture around our astronauts being treated like, you know, Marines or uh, people who are on a specific mission for the nation. And it's, it's not that the Italian astronaut isn't doing that on behalf of his nation, but it just is, I think that there's a, a different culture of work uh, in addition to what uh, Graham said, so that um, wasn't accounted for. And in the future, where you have people using, say, these, um, products uh, in space, I, I don't think that you necessarily have nation states sending people up on missions and that. I mean, they will, we will still continue, but I think the, the bigger market is for either individual um, volunteers or private companies uh, sending individuals and that, that has a different, um, different work culture. Yeah, and I, and I think just to expand upon that, and that sort of loops into what we were talking about before, is that um, 
in, in its infancy, the, the food systems, you know, when they talk about like tubes and cubes of dried foods and, and t- similar to like toothpaste tubes, at that point, the priority wasn't to think about, you know, cultural backgrounds and, and nostalgia and the food systems. It was just to make sure that people survived. But I think as we move forward into the future space missions and we talk about um, people potentially living for a long period of time in a, in a completely, um, completely foreign environment, I think at that point, psychology and, and morale take a take a higher a higher rank in the list of things that are important in the food systems. Great, and I think um, I, I, I do wonder if there are any fresh mozzarella options uh, <laughs> uh, in space right now. So I want to um, shift the conversation towards meat products specifically, uh, but. Uh, before I do, if you do have any questions, we will be opening up the Q&A, yeah, Q&A shortly. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to put them uh, in the Q&A and we'll get to them. Now, in terms of food in space, um, can we produce, and, and maybe this is initially directed towards you, DDA, can we produce a meat product that can last a very long shelf life? Uh, and I'm thinking you know, two to five year minimum and potentially without refrigeration. So is Mm -hmm. altered meat because of the way it's produced, could that give us the ability to have something that is not refrigerated and and has a very large shelf life? Um, Yes, as you know, there are two um, uh, phenomena causing um, uh, food to to get spoiled. One is uh, the bacterial um, uh, proliferation on the food and the other one is a um, biochemical uh, change and the uh, enzymatic uh, reaction or, or different types of reactions um, happening on the uh, biochemical level. So cultured food being, uh, sorry, cultured meat uh, being uh, potentially grown in a sterile environment um, as, uh, you know, as part of its uh, default um, production process might at least uh, help solving the issue of the, um, the bacteria and the spoilage due to bacteria. Uh, I'm not sure that it can uh, really help solving the, the other type of uh, spoilage, which is um, more on the molecular level, for instance, degradation of uh, nutrients or you know, other um, different types of, of uh, um, biochemical reactions. Um, our goal for space and for LF0 program is really to produce the meat locally, when and where it is produced, when, where, when and where it is uh, consumed. And so to have uh, the most flexible uh, possible system in order to provide the high quality nutrition needed um, you know, on demand. Uh, so to avoid those uh, problematics of uh, a long stem storage of pre-packaged food. And, and I think, um, w- w- there, so there's some great questions coming in and I, I do wanna kind of take the discussion back to you know, what we're doing in space, can we bring, or well, can we bring that technology back to Earth more than just kind of what we were describing of those limited resource missions? So, what we're developing for space, can we see uh, kind of be integrated into the regular diet here on on Earth? And again, not just for those resource limited uh, examples. Absolutely. I think of cultured meat as intelligent meat. And I, I, I will give three examples of how I, I see us bringing this uh, technology transfer back to Earth. One is closed loop systems. What DDA and others are working on um, will make it possible for there to be enough nutrients in a self sustaining closed loop um, ecosystem, if you will, because you should be able to consume this cultured meat and receive a lot of nutrients. Um, that you may not necessarily just receive from the same steak uh, that you would have down here. And um, I think improving that and making it an intelligent meat, not, necess- not necessarily, you know, uh, soy lint in a, in, a, in a meat form, but something that is dense, nutrient rich, could help solve problems here. Do you already um, alluded to my second um, example, which is food security? Because since the food uh, provided for space usually tends to be able to give energy for longer periods of time and shouldn't be burned immediately, um, like the case of refined cereals. So um, 
if you're building an intelligent niche that allows for people to face any activity that they have to accomplish in the best way, uh, you know, that could help us uh, with food security here on Earth. Uh, the third thing is health, because um, one goal of food in space is to combat a problem that astronauts face, which is um, containing and controlling cellular aging, um, which is why there's a lot of antioxidants that are recommended um, and used in the diet of astronauts. And I mean, when, when you come up with a specimen or a cultured meat that contains that right amount of nutritional substances, you know, proteins, but also fiber, um, then, you know, how can we use a similar technique for um, cellular aging here on Earth? So I, I do see it helping in those three ways. I believe those are very good points. And uh, there are actually two ways we can really bring back to Earth what we learn in space. Um, if we put aside the production process, the circular production um, approach and the, the closed loop system, uh, which is super relevant for food security, there are some specific uh, nutritional requirements in space, which might really apply as Izina mentioned. We're also thinking, for instance, about uh, um, astronauts uh, losing muscle mass in, uh, in long um, uh, space emissions. And uh, this is very relevant for a lot of uh, um, categories of, uh, of consumers on Earth. For instance, the elderly, um, older people tend to lose um, uh, muscle mass starting at 45, 50, you can lose up to 1.5% of your uh, muscle mass per year. That's huge. Um, so developing a, a meat which might be um, suitable for astronauts uh, to make sure that they can uh, maintain the, the, the muscle mass can then be applied um, back on Earth. So personalizing the food and, and making it uh, suitable to specific uh, nutritional needs. Um, I totally agree with the uh, Izine. Yeah, and I think kind of just to expand upon your, your last question, Alex, um, in terms of the two to five year shelf life and how that how that applies um, to lab room, I think the, the two to five year shelf life was sort of built was sort of built around this idea that all of the food that they would that the astronauts would be consuming would be made uh, and, and produced and packaged and preserved very, very far away from where it would be eaten. And so I think the the difference in what a lot of the the, the cell based meat um, and the cultured meat is trying to accomplish is that people could eat fresh food and, and not have to worry about how long they can preserve it because there'll be a closed loop system where they can get the nutrition that they need. And then I think in terms of your, um, your follow up question about why this is relevant to earth, I think at, at least at, at what we're hoping to accomplish at mission space food is that we just really believe that the, the core constraints, um, that are required to make things suitable for space travel, especially in terms of food, just have a direct comparison. I mean, it's, it's something as simple as the, um, trying to figure out how to produce uh, nutritious food using as small a footprint as possible and at a fraction of the resources that they're normally produced with on earth like has, has obvious and, and drastic um, implications to, to terrestrial markets. Great, any insight on maybe cultural changes and maybe uh, tastes or new types of foods that might come about from that outside of just technology? Yeah, I think I think there are there are some interesting things um, that come to mind, and I, I think Azine mentioned this briefly in, in an earlier comment, but that people's taste perceptions do change in space. And so normally, when you when you look at uh, packaged or prepared foods on Earth, they use like a certain small parameter of um, of ingredients to in, to improve flavor. It's normally like salt and acid and and sometimes spice. But there are different ways to to achieve those flavors, like trigeminal stimulation. If you if you've ever eaten like a, a peppermint candy that has that kind of cooling effect, or if you think about, you know, using something like Szechuan peppercorns that has like a tingling effect, there, there are lots of different ways that you can achieve flavor outside of the, the standard constraints of salt and, and fat and acid. Uh, and so for me, those kind of things are exciting and maybe outside of the regular confines of what would be good on a grocery store shelf, you wouldn't think to necessarily utilize these kinds of things, but because of like the fluid shift in microgravity, the way that people perceive taste changes. And so there's been um, the tons of accounts of astronauts saying that, you know, they don't eat spicy food on earth, but when they go to space, they're just putting sriracha um, on, on all of their food. And so, so much so that it actually causes like problems for their microbiome and even like the salt, the salt component or the salt content rather of the foods that they like to eat as it has affected people's vision. And so these kinds of things, um, I think just like everything else in space require creative solutions. 
Great. We have a question from Anton who asks, what are the challenges of operating bioreactors in space? Has any food fermentation been already tested at, uh, at the ISS? Yes, uh, there is, a, to the best of my knowledge, two bioreactors in, at the ISS today, one on the um, American uh, section and one on the uh, Russian section. So there had been uh, quite a, a lot of um, experience so far on um, operating bioreactors in space. Great, and in terms of um, limited resources such as water or other things like that, um, is there, are the changes that might need to be made for applications in space going to be very drastic in comparison to some of the, the bi for example, bioreactors or other systems we have here on Earth? Mm -hmm. Yes, the, the system uh, which has been used uh, for our experiment in, uh, in September last year is a system, a 3D bioprinter developed by uh, 3D bioprinting solutions, a company based in Moscow which is working on, uh, um, on microgravity um, an electromagnetic printer, which is super cool. Very uh, interesting uh, technology. So you, you cannot always just uh, transpose what works uh, on earth to space or what works uh, in space to earth. There are some uh, um, you know, different constraints. That's, that's true not only for the microgravity, but also um, you know, for the, the scale, for instance, on earth, we're really working on a, a large scale bioforms and meat production facilities. Uh, while on, in space, I believe that the scale will be, will be smaller and uh, we'll need to adapt our technologies to smaller uh, scales. And uh, the, the type of the, the inputs might also be slightly different. The type of inputs you can find in, uh, on Mars, for instance, might be slightly different than the type of inputs which are cheap and available um, on Earth. Uh, so there are some adaptations. It's not directly transposable. Um, but I believe that the, and many of the core concepts uh, can be shared and there is a strong uh, uh, common ground, a large common ground between both. Interesting. And it does help to kind of think of, of each of these scenarios as the kind of like the short, medium and long in this scenario, long. Um, and so that's a nice way to kind of set, set the stage. Now, we have a, a question about nutrition and it, it starts off by saying, you know, Astronauts are highly uh, intelligent, so they don't have fears of GMO products. <laughs> but when we talk about nutrition, uh, what can we do to kind of, uh, wh whether it's related to gen genetically modified food or not, what can we do to um, have better taste, durability, and nutrition profiles, um, and maybe just add on to the concept of what other things can we do to these new food products to add any type of uh, nutritional elements that, that we might not typically see. Um, so I guess in two parts, one, what are the plans for increasing uh, nutritional profiles? Uh, and then on uh, the other side of that, is there anything unique we can do to kind of add, add to that from a nutrition standpoint? Um, yeah, I can, I can take a shot at that one. Um, so I think I think my, my immediate answer would be that um, taste and nutrition are kind of like inextricably linked. During Grace Douglas's uh, talk previously, she was showing, you know, a graph of apricots stored at different temperatures over the course of a year or 18 months and how, you know, in, a, in appearance in an apricot that looks unappetizing, looks unappetizing because uh, it's deteriorated. And so uh, a reduction in like in beta carotene is kind of mirroring the, the food product becoming less appetizing. And so I think, well, I, I, don't, I don't necessarily know enough about um, production of GMO products to necessarily answer that question. I would say that there are opportunities in, um, in fortifying foods and also looking at uh, growing foods in space that will allow people to eat things that you don't necessarily have to worry so much about the shelf life if you're eating fresh uh, meats and vegetables in space. Great, and we have a question from Sarah directed towards DDA who asks, uh, is Ella Farms looking for, uh, looking at 3D printing as a future replacer of porous texture, uh, texturized soy? Pretty specific there. <laughs> yeah, actually we're, we're very, um, 
involved with different types of 3D uh, bioprinting technologies. Um, our chief scientist officer, Professor Levenberg, is not only the, the head of the uh, faculty for bi biomedical engineering at the Technion, she's also the head of the uh, 3D bioprinting unit. And so we have, a, a, I believe, you know, top uh, level um, uh, expertise in, in this type of, um, of technologies. We just do believe that 3D bioprinting is not yet ready for mass production and will not be in the next couple of years. Uh, so we have decided for, for the first product we aim at releasing on Earth not to rely on 3D bioprinting, but rather to rely on uh, uh, other patents we have uh, developed and, uh, and validated um, with a, a textured protein as a, as a scaffold. Uh, but we do have some, um, you know, some, uh, let's say, um, ideas how uh, 3D bioprinting can fit very well into our existing production system. And for space specifically, um, the experiment uh, performed last year was using 3D bioprinting. And I believe it can be an interesting um, tool to implement for um, producing textured and structured food in space. We do recognize that uh, food is not just nutrients. And um, as uh, Gaham mentioned, as uh, Izina mentioned, uh, food is, is an experience. And uh, um, in order to reproduce an experience and the experience of meat, you have to make sure that you get the texture right. Um, and uh, um, yeah, 3D bioprinting can be a good uh, way to achieve that in, uh, when you have uh, limited resources. Great, so two more questions before we wrap up here. For each of you individually, what is really kind of like the next phase for some of the projects that you're working on. And um, I guess if we were to direct it towards uh, SNA for terraformers, what would be next after the, for example, the gardens? For us, uh, we are moving towards um, intelligent gardens. So we intentionally focus on the primitive way of growing food, which is in soil because of again, space research rather than growing food in greenhouses. But I'm uh, making it intelligent by uh, adding networks to the gardens, adding sensors so that um, you can monitor it uh, from, a, from wherever you are, if you're, you know, if you're not under lockdown and you can um, network it with other gardens and the community can share uh, information about different, um, different harvests. And what this, how it applies to space is we then learn um, how sensors can photograph um, food well and how uh, it responds to commands, how we can measure um, or moisture um, at really a miniature level uh, for a sensor rather than a big spacecraft that uh, monitors the soil moisture. That way we have a, a better understanding of how to um, send uh, information to people in space, but the food next door is you know, ready. So this is a technology that can be used uh, in greenhouses. And some form of it is being used in greenhouses. Too. Great, and I can imagine there's a tremendous amount of data that can be coming in that will have many applications. Uh, very cool. Precisely. Great, uh, Graham, what's next for Mission Space Food? What's kind of like the next phase that your team is working on? Yeah, absolutely. And so I think this kind of ties into the last question I answered about uh, sort of the link between flavor and nutrients. And it's not, it's not just to expand on that, it's not quite so simple that um, as food degrades, it becomes less delicious and therefore it's worse for you. It's also tied into um, so sometimes there are ultra nutritious products that haven't necessarily degraded, but don't have the flavor to get people to want to eat them. And so I think that's another thing that Grace Douglas um, talked about in her last, uh, her last uh, seminar is that in shorter duration missions that they introduced meal replacement bars, uh, morale went down, there were negative psychological impacts, and then also uh, people just ate less as a result. And so there's another another level um, to which flavor is important is that it, it drives people to want it, to want to consume more nutrients. And so that really the next step for us uh, in, in bringing our product to market is that we want to um, create extremely nutritious products that people crave to eat. And so we believe that this is a way to address uh, the bulk of the public who has micronutrient deficiencies um, that aren't otherwise served by really an, an enormous supplement industry because the types of people who would take the time to research and go out and figure out what sort of micronutrients they should be consuming aren't necessarily the people with the diet and lifestyles um, that, that need these things the most. 
Great, interesting. And DDA, what would be the next phase uh, when it comes to uh, your programs related to space? Mm -hmm. We're currently having discussions with uh, different um, partners in order to build up a whole, um, let's say, group of companies working on uh, on this um, this uh, uh, this field for um, producing meat locally on. Uh, um, uh, uh, other planets than uh, than Earth. Um, we've seen what the uh, UK is doing, which is great in uh, integrated culture. I think he's uh, giving a presentation, uh, uh, you know, soon, and I encourage you know any one of you to really uh, stay tuned for his presentation. And um, there are a few other companies and uh, different uh, types of technologies which have been uh, developed so far, which have been under uh, development for some time, which are um, complementary to what we do. And uh, we're really working today on uh, uh, building the right um, a group of uh, of companies and uh, um, and partners to to deliver the um, the vision. Great, yeah, and and Yuki's talk that's upcoming in many ways. I, I think of uh, maybe if you can apply the Terraformers network to what Yuki is doing from a from a maybe not from a call net standpoint, but from some of the DIY standpoint, that could be some very interesting data that comes in. Uh, <laughs> great, so um, I know we're just about coming up, uh, up on time, but I did wanna end on a very broad note, right? So in the next decade, what can we, uh, what can we imagine in terms of space technology that the average person is not thinking about that we will see? So in the next decade, what is something that people aren't thinking about that that we'll, we'll start to see. We could start with that. Uh, so uh, one thing I, I have to commend this group for again is in the face of many varied and uh, technical challenges of getting the human to uh, for far away lands, um, it is not trivial but um, to think about what's for dinner. And as far as um, the next decade, there will be a lot of innovation transfer. Some of you may know that there's a company um, who builds Mars vehicles that will be using it now to innovate in air travel so that it would take us 35 minutes to get to Dubai and maybe just 55 minutes to get to Australia. So that's coming up in um, a few years. As things like growing food on aircraft so that you have a fresh salad if you have a, a long flight or on a cruise ship, you know, that way you don't have food that's too dry or too humid, which we tend to um, prevent in space anyway. So, so the ability um, to have better meals at 10,000 um, feet uh, when we're around to, allowed to move freely again is I think on the horizon. And lastly, the third point is, and DDA uh, alluded to this 20 years ago, you know, we had mostly four nation states in space, but we are going to see in the next decade is increased accessibility, increased democratization, less intimidation of space, and more, m many more sectors um, involved in diversifying space, and not just the food sector, the cultured meat sector, robotics, um, manufacturing, agriculture. I think that space is um, coming home, which is where it, it should be anyway, because it affects you know a lot, um, many areas of our lives. Great. Uh, DDA or Graham, next 10 years, what might, what, what might we see? I can, I can go for it. So I think uh, any, anytime, in my opinion, at least anytime a project goes from um, the public sector to the private sector, it really kind of ramps up the ability for that thing to be accessible to the public um, and, and can lower costs. And so I guess on the, on the reasonably short term, I, I would really hope that space tourism, which is something that people have been talking about for a long time, maybe becomes more accessible. Um, but I think kind of to, uh, as an ace point is that many of the things that many of the innovations that we interact with on a day-to-day -day scale were a result of, um, innovations that happened for space. And I think only as we begin to explore further into space and more people go into space and we develop more technology, my, my hope is that these technologies that were innovated for space become more of an integral part to our lives. And I, I, I think lastly, kind of along the same lines of that. Um, especially during times of, you know, political and economic struggle and, and with the whole coronavirus situation going on, I think space can really act as an opportunity for people to come together. And so that, that's what I hope is that this, um, this, this core tenant kind of, of humanity in, in terms of exploration and, and coming together to overcome challenges can, can sort of unite us. 
I connect very much with uh, what uh, Gahan said, um, and actually in the in in the rocket which took our uh, cells to the ISS, we had uh, three astronauts. One uh, who was uh, a Russian. We had an uh, um, Israeli American and uh, an Emirate one. So we had the uh, Israelis, Arabs, Russians, uh, U.S. astronauts teaming up together um, and going to space together, spending time together, uh, and kind of. Uh, elevating themselves above any uh, cleavage on earth and that was really um, really moving uh, to see how people can work together when when they look uh, beyond uh, the, the the horizon I do believe that uh, what will be maybe um, surprising for some with will that uh, is that uh, the human species will start to permanent, permanently live in uh, on different planets than, than Earth. Uh, we, we see that very, um, very clear now. Um, and as Ale Farms has a mission to deliver high quality nutrition to anyone, anytime, anywhere, so we'll be there as well. If people live on the moon, we'll deliver meat to the people living there. If people live in the, the Sahara, we'll deliver uh, meat there. On Mars, we'll deliver meat there. So we, we will uh, follow after the uh, human species development to make sure that we provide a uh, large support, high quality food um, to anyone, anytime, anywhere. Thank you very much. And a beautiful note to end on. I apologize for going over. I greatly appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Uh, and this concludes our session. Thank you. Thank you. It was great. Thank, uh, you. thank you very much. It was really great.